at this point, so we are therefore subsidizing a service, for example, education. And then we have to answer all of these questions about the best way to organize a publicly funded education. Would it be a voucher system? Would it be decentralized uh, schools uh, that uh, cities would have? Would it be um, uh, to build state schools like it is in most countries? And if we build state school, again, we have to decide, should we build them uh, with a lot big classes, small classes, etc. The thing is, beneficiaries, they will have to take what we give them unless the service becomes so bad that they prefer to pay uh, their own money to go to private school or uh, quit altogether. But unless we are in this extreme situation, in which case, for example, in Uttar Pradesh, there is a de facto privatization of education, we know that something's wrong at that time. But that might be too late. If we want to intervene before and make sure that we can improve the quality of education, not make it worse with a new, new initiative, there's no guarantee that money is well spent. And to make sure that money is well spent, we need two things. We need to know that the policy or the program has really taken place. And we need to know whether or not the policy made any difference. And that's difficult. And the reason why that's difficult is that when we try to do impact evaluation rather than process evaluation, we would like to compare, ideally, in the ideal world, we would like to compare Esther's situation if she got such and such program to Esther's situation if she didn't get such and such program. But of course, we'll never see Esther in two states of the world. So that's not possible. So we want to contrast the outcome for those exposed to a policy to the outcome they would have experienced if they had not been exposed to that policy. And the difficulty is all in this conditional tense, how to constitute an adequate comparison group. I'll give you one example, uh, which is an example I worked on, which is mandated representation of women, which was uh, introduced already by Enriqueta. So over 100 countries have some form of mandated representation. And we could ask two types of questions. Does it make a difference in terms of electing a number of women? So that's easy to check. We can check how many women get elected. Second question we might ask is, do women make a difference on policy decision? Or does the fact of having women changes the attitude towards women? And here we have the immediate problem that the constituencies where women are elected are different from those where women are not elected. They are more favorably disposed toward women. They may have different policy preferences. Therefore, comparing policy decision and attitude across different type of places <laughs> will not tell us the impact of having a woman in politics. And this problem is general. That's the typical evolution problem. So how do we solve it? <coughs> Traditional econometric uses statistical techniques, such as regression and matching, to control for all the available variables. So the difficulty here is to make sure that we have control for everything. And if we live in a world where people have the tendency to overestimate their success, the, f the compounding problem is usually when you use a slightly different method, you get a slightly different result. And so if the evaluator can sort of choose which result to pick, you have this file drawer, drawer bias where only the good result come the light of the day. The second technique is a, a natural experiment where we exploit situation where by chance groups happen to be strictly comparable. For example, in, in this case, you could compare places where women just won to places where women just lost. And there you would have very comparable places except that one happened to have a woman and one doesn't. So that's a great technique, which has been used uh, very profitably. The problem is that we might not be able to evaluate every single idea we would like to evaluate. Sometimes it's, uh, so I, I think we should use this, and in fact, that as well, as soon as we get an, uh, an occasion to do it well, but we might not always be able to do it well. So what is the uh, third possibility, the one that I practice uh, in most of my research, not all of it actually, is uh, randomized evaluation, which is before the program starts, work with a partner to assign the program randomly to a subset of an eligible group, which you call the treatment group. And you can now, because the, you have a random subset of the group, they are strictly comparable to another group that don't get the program, or you can try two versions of the program, or two programs against each other, and run a kind of horse race. The groups are now strictly comparable, so we can determine the impact of the program by determining the impact of the treatment in the comparison group. And this is often possible for pilot program, which is why I'm talking about experimentation. 
which is I think it's almost impossible to do in practice and also rhetorically, politically, everything when the program is already announced to be full scale. You do that when it's not yet full scale, which usually you have like a year to experiment before doing something nationwide. So for pilot program, when the budget is limited, which is often the case in developing countries when we work with NGOs who in any case have enough money to work with 50 schools, so you might as well leverage these very small sums to learn something. When the program is being phased in, or sometimes when it's considered that randomization is just the best way to allocate the, the program, irrespective of the need for evaluation, which happens more than often than you need. One example of that is, uh -huh, we are uh, I'm taken by technology. Okay, so it's okay. I'll manage. One example of that is uh, uh, precisely this question of, don't worry, don't worry. I'll, I'll figure it out. One, uh, one, one example of that is, um, um, in 90, is, is this question of uh, whether women make a difference. So to, to answer this question with an Indian colleague, we exploited a 1993 constitutional amendment in India, which made uh, rep um, 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 representation of women at the local level mandatory. So in each municipal council, one third of representative must be women. And also, at each election, election takes pl take place every five years, at each election, one third of the city can only elect a woman. So to avoid uh, manipulation, political manipulation, to avoid that all the women would end up in the back of beyond, they decided that at each election, they needed to draw randomly a set of villages that have to elect a woman. So in that case, we can compare first the type of investment that are made by women versus men. So here we did this for two states, West Bengal and Rajasthan. That's the biggest result, which is women invest much more in drinking water, both in West Bengal and Rajasthan. More generally, women invest more in infrastructure that is of immediate use to women and less in infrastructure that is of immediate use to men. So in West Bengal, this is schools, and in Rajasthan, these are roads. The second question you can ask is the impact of discrimination against women. It could go both ways, right? It could be the case that uh, having quotas make people more anti-woman because they hate quotas. Uh, so, uh, or you could have a cotton lowry type of argument. Or it could go the other way. It could be that uh, having quotas uh, gives women the chance to show their worth. And if you start from a situation where there is statistical discrimination, that is, people think women are incompetent, and in fact they're not, then you give them a chance to show their competence. So the problem here is to measure uh, com people's perception of women's competences. Because if you just ask them, they are going to tell you what they think you want to hear. Uh, so what we did is that we, we taped, we, we, took a, we, we took a speech that was given by one of these mayor, and we had a bunch of women actors and men actors tape it, same speech. And then when we went to people's home, we randomized whether we gave you the men's speech or the female speech, uh, keeping in mind it's the same. So the first thing you observe is that, uh, focus if you want on the male thing. In the blue bar, which goes beyond, this is a difference between the rating given by people who have heard the female speech versus the male speech. So you see it's negative because people exposed to the same speech think it's a worse speech if it's given by a, by a woman. So that's what I call statistical discrimination because it's all about competence, etc. This is if they have never been exposed to a woman, Maya. If they've been exposed to a, man, to a woman mayor through the reservation policy in the past, this goes from being a negative bias against women to a positive bias against women. They more than compensate. Now they think that the speeches given by women are better than the speech given by men, even though, remember, it's the same speech. For women, thinks is, it goes also in that same direction, but less. They start with less bias, and they end up with even lesser bias, but not much. <coughs> 